So this morning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Ethan to come on up. Um, like, I don't even know that I don't even know that I know his whole testimony. I'm just going to be honest. Like, like we, you know, everything, and you've been with it four years, you know, four years. And there's always things that I know people want to share and always things that people want to give. You know, the Bible says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And so today we're going to get a testimony um, that we can hang on to and a testimony of something that God has brought him through. And so thank you. Appreciate it. Good morning, y'all. I'm going to move this. I have a weird thing with symmetry, so I want to be right in the middle. Well, I appreciate y'all letting me tell my story this morning. I do have a couple of disclaimers. Um, number one, I'm not a public speaker, so uh, I'm a little nervous. Bear with me. Uh, number two, my goal was to make it through this without getting too emotional, but I can tell you through the writing process and the preparation that that's not going to happen. So, again, bear with me. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Ethan, and I'm an addict and an alcoholic. I'm grateful to be here speaking this morning for several reasons. First and foremost, there is no earthly reason that I should be here. I should be dead or in prison. The only reason that I'm able to be here today is by the grace of God. Secondly, there's a saying in the recovery world, and it says you can't keep it unless you give it away. It's also called the 12th step. And similar to the Bible, there are several different ways it's worded, depending on the group or the text it comes from. But my favorite and the most applicable to my message today is this. Having received healing and spiritual renewal, we can retain them only as we offer them to others. You see, when Bill W. wrote the 12 steps in 1938, he used the Bible as his foundation. Uh, and just as Christians were called to share the gospel, as addicts were called to share the message of recovery. And much, or recovery is a gift, and much like God's grace, it is meant to be shared. So if my story can make an impact on one person today, then all of this is 100% worth it. So let me start by telling you a little bit about my childhood. My mom and dad divorced before I can even remember, so growing up in a single parent household uh, was just my normal. It never felt like I came from a broken home or anything like that. It was definitely a modest upbringing, but I had an amazing mom who did everything she could to provide a normal childhood for me. I never knew how poor we really were until I got a little bit older. My relationship with my dad was inconsistent at best. He was in and out of jail during my younger years, but I was still able to spend time with him every other weekend for the most part. Again, this was my normal, and I never felt like I was shorted or was missing anything from my childhood. I didn't grow up in church. My mom and I never went to church. My dad grew up old school Church of Christ, and given his history, he was kind of the black sheep of the family. And this was well known in the church community. He would take me to church on occasion, and it was always a place where you're expected to wear, wear a suit and tie. You know, they sang a cappella from a hymnal and kind of looked me up and down in my ratty jeans and t-shirt. They were always nice enough, but they looked and talked to me and my dad with a tone of sympathy, if you will like we just weren't quite good enough to be there. Even as a 10 year old kid, I was able to pick up on this, so I can only imagine how my dad felt, just trying to do right by a son and by God, only to be met with judgment. Later on in my life, he opened up about his opinions of church and religion, and it was without a doubt experiences like that that shaped those opinions. And rightly so, because it was right then and there that I decided that church was not for me. Then a few years later, a friend invited me to church camp in South Padre Island. I wasn't crazy about the idea of getting involved in church, but I really wanted to go to Padre. <laughs> so I agreed to go, but it was definitely uh, with a little bit of hesitation. As soon as I got on the bus, I looked around all the, at all the other kids, and I knew I didn't fit in. I remember thinking to myself, the bus hasn't left yet. It's not too late to bail. But I stuck it out, and I'm glad I did. They were so nice and accepting of me, and for the first time, I saw the good that can come from the church. It was also my first experience with the Holy Spirit, and I ended up getting saved on that trip and baptized shortly after getting home. That was the point in my young life that I was the happiest, most confident, and most authentic me that I can remember. But let me tell you, when God starts working in your lives is when the devil attacks, and attack he did. 
It would only be a few months before I strayed from God's path. It was the summer of 2002 that I was saved and baptized, and then in the fall of 2002, I broke my ankle during a middle school football game. I had to be carried off the field, and my mom took me to the hospital. There, they gave me hydrocodone and sent me home with a prescription for more. That's the moment that the trajectory, trajectory excuse me, of my life changed. I can still remember everything about the exact moment that the drugs took effect, from the way I felt to the car we were driving in to the exact place on Shredway Boulevard just a little way south of here that I was. I was 13 years old. I'd spend the next 13 years chasing that high. My oldest son is sitting right there this morning, and he's 12 years old. Even though he's a great kid and is growing up much differently and in a much different time than I did, it still terrifies me to think that the devil could be attacking him just like he did me. So I hope he's listening intently this morning. If only we had all listened to everything our parents said, right? <laughs> Up to that point, my exposure to drugs and alcohol had been pretty limited. I'd heard kids talking about it and I knew kids who were drinking and smoking cigarettes and weed but I had no interest in any of it, and I was able to steer clear of it at school and with my circle of friends. But once I took those first pills, my outlook changed. There's another saying in the recovery world that says, I don't know if I was born an addict, but I know the first time that I used an addict was born. That could not be more true in my experience. At that point, I started hanging around with kids that I knew had access to drugs and alcohol. It started out relatively tame. I'd spend the night with friends whose parents kept a well-stocked liquor cabinet. We'd sneak a few pulls off the bottle and maybe steal a Virginia Slim or two once their parents were asleep. But soon it graduated to getting friends' older siblings to buy us beer and our very own pack of smokes. But by the end of my eighth grade year, my friends and I were buying weed at school and skipping class to go smoke in, a near, in an alley nearby. <clears throat> then I got to high school. Drugs and alcohol were more readily available than ever, and the party scene drew me in quickly. I was 14 years old running around with guys who were 17, 18 years old. By the time I was 16 years old, I was using hard drugs, smoking weed daily, and drinking every chance I got. I was a pretty talented athlete. I played football and baseball, and school came very easy to me. So because of that, I was able to fly under the radar and avoid any major consequences. But all my friends were so fortunate. On October 1st, 2006, my mom was working late, so I decided to have some friends over for a small party. But word got out, as so often does in a small town where there's not a whole lot to do, and my small party got out of hand really quickly. Knowing that my mom would kill me, I decided to shut it down and made everybody leave. The next morning I woke up to the news that three of my close friends were involved in a drunk driving accident. The two passengers were killed. The driver barely survived, but ultimately was convicted of vehicular manslaughter, or I'm sorry, intoxicated manslaughter, and served eight years in prison for it. They were all 19 years old. I felt a lot of guilt about that for a long time. And even though the accident was a stark reminder of the potential consequences I could be facing, it only fueled my substance abuse. In May of 2007, I graduated from high school and was accepted to McMurray University. I even managed to earn an academic scholarship to help pay for some of the way. They asked me to play football, but by the time I got there, I was burnt out on sports. I was more interested in partying and figured I need to work to help pay for school. I started working at a job that was not a good influence on me. All of my coworkers were heavy partiers, and I was making really good money for a kid right out of high school with almost no responsibilities. It was at this job that I was reunited with the drug that started it all. One of my coworkers had a massive prescription for hydrocodone and typically sold the majority of his pills. I became his best customer. I was hooked immediately. I finished that first year of college with a 1.8 GPA and lost my scholarship. I figured I was making good enough money and college was not nearly as easy for me as high school was, so I decided I was gonna drop out. My addiction was growing and making it even harder, so I knew that I couldn't keep it up. But luckily, my mom talked me into staying, so I stayed enrolled, but I barely went to class. 
it was really hard to make a 9 a.m. philosophy class when you were up till three or four partying every morning. <clears throat> By this time, I was drinking, smoking weed, and taking pills every day. But I wasn't picky. I'd also partake in any and every other drug I could get my hands on. I was already heading down a dark path going 100 miles an hour when I met a girl who was not good for me, nor was I good for her. She had substance abuse and mental health issues of her own, so when we got together, it was like fire and gasoline. We both knew that that relationship was toxic, uh, but we're both too scared or too stubborn to walk away. My addiction was amplified. It was then that I started to recognize that I had a problem, and I came to the conclusion that ending the relationship was the best thing for both of us. But before I could make a break, she told me that she was pregnant. Wanting to do the right thing, I decided to put my feelings aside and try to make the relationship work for our child's sake. But the toxicity remained, and a healthy relationship just wasn't achievable for us. To make matters worse, she was able to clean herself up when she got pregnant, but I wasn't. I was drinking and drugging more than ever, plus working a full-time job and going to school full-time. That left little time for a pregnant girlfriend, and we would ultimately part ways five months before our baby was due. Even though being a normal family looked as if it wasn't in the cards for us, I still wanted to be in my child's life. However, his mom felt otherwise and made every attempt possible to keep that from happening. And given my behavior at the time, I can't say that I blame her. But between living with my own selfish behavior leading up to the birth of my son and the downright maliciousness that I was receiving from his mom, I started to spiral. What was already out of control became exponentially worse. Then, just when I was ready to give up, I met Julia. We were just friends in the beginning, and neither of us had any intention of it becoming anything more than that. But she came, became my shoulder to cry on, and she allowed me to vent about the things going on in my life. But I was careful not to let her get too close. She knew I had a wild side, but she had no idea the full extent of my addiction. Over a short period of time, we became very close and eventually started dating. Then, not long after that, Mac was born. Julia was the one that gave me the strength to fight for a relationship with my son. The combination of my son being born and having a girl that was a positive influence in my life slowed me down just enough to keep living. If it hadn't been for those two events, I have no doubt that I wouldn't have made it to see my 22nd birthday. Although I slowed down a little bit, unfortunately it wasn't enough to cure me of my addiction and I continued taking pills daily. A few months after Mac was born, I asked Julia to marry me. She said yes, and we started planning a wedding. But there was only one problem, and it was a big one. I was living a lie. I was deep in active addiction, and the girl I was supposed to marry had no idea. I remember pacing up and down the hallway of our duplex thinking, can't let her marry a junkie. But I couldn't stop, and I was afraid if I told her the truth that she would leave me, and I didn't want to live life without her. So I kept taking pills, and I kept my mouth shut. I was high when I walked down the aisle in August of 2011. By December of 2012, somehow I was able to complete the required course load for my bachelor's degree and was getting ready to graduate. The only way I was able to get out of bed and pull myself together to go walk the stage was to take a handful of pills. It had gotten to the point where I couldn't go 24 hours without pills or I would start withdrawals and get violently ill. I knew long before that point that I had a problem, but now I knew I had to do something about it. So in early 2013, I came clean to Julia. I told her about my addiction and that I wanted to get clean. If you know Julia, you know that she is one of the sweetest, most gracious human beings on the planet. And she showed me love and compassion and did everything she could to help me get clean. So I stopped taking pills and breaks for the hell that was coming. Opiate withdrawals won't kill you, but you will wish you were dead. Couldn't eat, couldn't sleep. My body ached all day, every day. I lost 20 pounds in 20 days. Then on the 21st day, I couldn't take it anymore and I got high. Just like that, I was right back where I started. Then in June of 2013, we made the tough decision to leave Abilene. Julia had gotten a job opportunity in Fort Worth. That was a big step in her professional career. And I knew that getting out of Abilene was my only chance to get clean once and for all. But sadly, I was wrong. Addiction goes with you wherever you go. And I, 
found myself driving back to Abilene a couple times a week to buy pills. But it wasn't long before I found a solid connection for pills in Fort Worth. But accessing those pills meant going to a part of town known as Stop 6. It was rough, but it was better than driving 250 miles to Abilene and back. Stop 6 was not a place that I should have been, and I was not welcome there. I can't tell you how many times I had a gun pointed in my face and was told to kick rocks, but that didn't stop me from running around trying to get my fix. By late 2013, I could no longer afford, my, to, afford to fund my habit, but I couldn't just stop either. The things that I had to do in order to fund my addiction caused me so much shame and guilt that the only way that I could deal with those feelings was to use. And the only way I could use was to do the things that caused more shame and guilt. I was caught in a vicious cycle and I didn't know how to get out. So in early 2015, I ended up at the methadone clinic in hopes that I would receive the help I needed to get clean. Unfortunately, it was just substituting one drug for another and methadone turned out to be much worse than anything else I'd ever experienced. It was almost no time at all before I found a plug for methadone on the streets and it was at least twice as expensive as the other drugs. So there I was buying drugs in a clinical setting and on the streets with money that I didn't have. <clears throat> and the thing about methadone is it's designed to plateau very quickly, meaning you have to take more and more in order to get the high you need. My habit was costing me hundreds of dollars a day and the things I was doing to keep, me, keep up make me sick to think about today. Then finally in August of 2015, it all caught up with me. I was caught doing what I had to to fund my addiction, but even in my very worst moment, I was shown compassion and I was given a choice. Either enter an inpatient rehab program or face criminal charges and most likely go to prison. But even though I knew it was over and I knew I needed help, I did not want to go to rehab. I was ready to do the time. Thankfully, Julia was able to talk some sense into me and convince me to go to rehab. And on September 2nd, 2015, I checked into a 30-day residential program, followed by six weeks of intensive outpatient treatment and then six months of continuing care treatment where I was required to, required to point in one, report once a week for a group and individual counseling sessions for a grand total of nine months of treatment. But turns out that nine months was the easy part. <clears throat> Getting sober is nothing compared to staying sober especially when you have the accountability of being required to check in regularly at a treatment center. It wasn't until I completed treatment and was officially released from the program that the real challenges started. I had to use what I learned in treatment to stay sober. And what I learned was faith and dependence on a higher power. You see, I believed in God this whole time. I felt the Holy Spirit so many years prior, so I knew without a doubt that God was real. But up until that point, I believed that God had turned his back on me. I was no longer worthy of God's grace because of my actions. It wasn't until I got to rehab that I learned just how wrong I was. Part of the treatment was meeting regularly with one one on one with a chaplain. My first meeting with him was on my second day of treatment, and the first question he asked me was, "Do you believe in God?" And I said, "Yes." The second question he asked me was, do you consider yourself a Christian? Do you believe in Jesus? Again, I said yes, but from that point on in that meeting, all I could do was cry. He continued to ask questions and talk to me about treatment and addiction, but I couldn't begin to tell you what he said because I was too busy sobbing uncontrollably. But what he said next, I remember clear as day, and it will stick with me for as long as I live. He said, it's okay. All these tears tell me that Jesus can still touch your heart. He never left you. He's been with you the whole time. And at that moment, I knew he was right. I felt the same Holy Spirit that had touched my heart 13 years earlier. When I looked back at my life, I could see God working the entire time. While I was in active addiction, I wasn't paying attention to what he was doing, and I couldn't hear what he was saying. But every time I took a wrong turn, God was there to nudge me back towards him. I wasn't on the path that he intended for me, but he refused to let me stray too far. 
all of that pain and suffering God used to help me get to where I am now, and I can see that clearly now. From my relationship with my son's mom ending and my vision of my perfect family being destroyed, to the birth of my son and me meeting and marrying the woman who makes me a better man. God knew that relationship wasn't right for either of us and would ultimately have destroyed us both, as well as had a horrible impact on our son. Then God sent me Mac and Julia in completely different ways just when I needed them most. From the circumstances of my ultimatum that ended my addiction to my presence at the methadone clinic at the perfect time. When I got busted, the circumstances were terribly painful, but had they been different, I would not have been offered the choice that ultimately saved my life. I would have been sent to prison with no questions asked. God even brought good from the methadone clinic where few good things come. One of the requirements of being enrolled in that program was meeting with a counselor, counselor regularly. My counselor at the methadone clinic was the one who told me about a church in Fort Worth known as the Hospital Church where countless recovering addicts and alcoholics make up the congregation. So when I completed my treatment program and was officially released back into the real world without a safety net, Julie and I both knew I needed to do something different, and that started with growing my relationship with God and surrounding myself with people who were focused on the same thing. On Thursday, October 1st, 2015, the nine-year anniversary of the drunk driving accident that rocked me and should have been my wake-up call so many years earlier, Julia picked me up from rehab and said we're going to that church on Sunday. I knew that it was the right thing to do and I knew that my sobriety depended on it. But all of a sudden those feelings of judgment and inadequacy, inadequacy that I had felt as a kid came rushing back. If I wasn't good enough then as a 10 year old innocent kid, what made me think I'd be good enough now as a 26 year old addict fresh out of rehab with the wounds caused by shame and guilt still wide open. Another example of God working and the devil attacking. The devil wanted me back all to himself, but I recognized that and I knew that he would get his way if I didn't take action and stand in faith. Today, that is still one of my favorite parts of being sober, being able to recognize when I'm being attacked and fighting in faith rather than succumbing to the lies. Julie and I went to that church that next Sunday and found a community of people like us, broken human beings who found healing in Jesus and in our brothers and sisters in Christ. We got connected and made lifelong friends with like-minded people who were there to support us no matter what life threw at us. That church, and when I say that church, I mean the people who made up the body of Christ, not the building, not the pastor, not the sermons. That church is where I learned to build the foundation of faith in God and his promises for me that I still stand on and continue to build on today. So you can imagine when the time came to leave Fort Worth and come back to Abilene, we were a little apprehensive. We didn't want to leave the church that had been so instrumental in my recovery, especially to go back to the place where all my problems began. But we prayed and we prayed, and God made it clear that Abilene was where we needed to be. So we stepped out in faith and were blessed beyond measure by doing so. When we got back to Abilene, we knew we needed to find a new church home and that our last church left big shoes to fill. We bounced around to a couple of, couple of churches for the first couple of months, but none of those churches felt like home. Then we saw Kirk House on Facebook talking about this new church in Abilene where he was leading worship. We used to follow Kirk around the bar scene back in the day when I was still drinking and drugging. We loved his music and thought if he was at this church, then we should check it out. The first Sunday that we attended Connect Church, we were greeted at the door by smiling faces and the now familiar, glad you're here, welcome home. Then within the first 60 seconds of walking in the door, Pastor Adam walked right up to us, shook our hands and introduced himself. We had a pretty good idea that we were right where we were supposed to be, right then and there. The next, meet, the next week, we met with Pastor Adam and Pastor Farah and they explained their vision for Connect Church to us. It was a vision that aligned perfectly with what we were seeking. The week after that, we got hooked up with a small group at the Butler's house where we found more people like us who were ready to walk in faith side by side with us. You see, God was still working in our lives in a big way. Julie and I had been trying to get pregnant for five years prior to that point. God may delay, but he's never late. He just needed us to be 
where we were supposed to be before he gave us that blessing. This church believed for us. Y'all were faithful that God would provide for us, which causes us to believe and be faithful as well. Almost exactly one year after coming to Connect, Calvin was born. If that isn't God at work, I don't know what is. And I'm happy to tell y'all this morning that this Friday, September 16th, I will celebrate seven years of sobriety. Thank you. And I hope I'm clear when I say that's by the grace of God alone. Okay, I feel like I've been talking for a really long time now. <laughs> but before I wrap it up, I want to leave you with a couple of key points. Point number one, God's grace is free and readily available for everyone. You're never too far gone or unworthy of receiving God's grace. However, sometimes God needs you to act in order to fully understand that grace. Now, I want to be strategic here because the Bible is clear in saying that grace is not something that is earned by good deeds. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 say, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. I want to emphasize the part that says through faith. Faith is an action word. You have to step out in faith, and grace will be your gift. What Brene Brown says about grace really resonates with me. Grace means that all of your mistakes now serve a purpose instead of serving shame. I'm gonna repeat that. Grace means that all of your mistakes now serve a purpose instead of serving shame. Point number two, taking action or stepping out in faith is a crucial aspect of recovery. Believing and doing are two very different things. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. We are responsible for the effort, not the outcome. The disease of addiction doesn't just involve drugs and alcohol. It can manifest itself in many different ways. As human beings, we are all broken in one way or another. We all have a hole in our heart that we try to fill with things that don't belong there. In my case, it was drugs and alcohol. In other cases, it might be money or worldly, worldly possessions. It could be food, sex, or gambling. But the only thing that can fill that void is God. It's hard to spot a spiritual crisis. Usually it's disguised as a crisis in our relationships, finances, career, or family. But our disease involved much more than just using drugs or any of those things I just mentioned. So our recovery must involve much more than simple abstinence. Luke chapter 11 verse 9 says, And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. The common denominator in that verse is action. And point number three, and lastly, the opposite of addiction is connection. An addict alone is in bad company. Surround yourself with others who choose to walk in faith. Galatians 6.2 says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, says, two people are better than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But if someone who falls alone is in real trouble, Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. So if you're in here this morning and you're struggling, I encourage you to reach out. Reach out to someone who is walking in faith. Keep coming back to church. Find someone to stand back to back and conquer with. Thank you. Wow, y'all can be seated. 
Wow. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I don't, if y'all didn't cry during that, something's wrong. Um, I was up there wiping tears, just so y'all know. God's amazing in what he does. And I love how you ended it because action is, is what it's all about. Us accepting Christ. No, we couldn't do it on our own. If you ever thought that you could work your way into heaven or work your way to God, you're wrong simply by receiving him into your life. So I just want to give you an opportunity this morning. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to have you come up front. But we want to give you an opportunity this morning to check your heart, to seek out and say, you know what, is my relationship with God strong? Do I just know God but not really following him? Or do I not even have a relationship with him? You know, I am so thankful that, that God brought Ethan and Julia and their family here. They are a blessing to the body of Christ. And you are not here by accident. We have this saying around here that you were born on purpose for a purpose. That God created you specifically for a reason that you can't get away from. And you're not here by accident. You're here on a purpose this morning. So if you guys would just bow your heads this morning. I'm not going to ask you to come up front. I'm not going to ask you to even stand up. But I do want to know if there's anybody in this room that says, you know what? I need to re-up my relationship with God. Or I need to start a relationship with God. And if that's you this morning, I just want to know. Because I want to pray for you. I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to have you come up front. But I do want to pray for you this morning. So if you would, just, just slip your hand up so I can see it and say, hey, you know what? I need to re-up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, you see our hearts today. You see the hands that were raised that said that they're ready for a deeper relationship with you. Father, you've moved on our hearts today. Lord, I just thank you for each person that is here. Father, I thank you that as they lifted their hands this morning, they said, Father, I need more of you. I want more of you. God, change our hearts. Because it's more about just saying a prayer, Father. It's about completely changing our lives. It's about turning away from where we were going and looking unto you, Father. So thank you for that this morning. So all of you guys look up here this morning. If you raised your hand this morning, or maybe you didn't raise your hand this morning, but you know God's prompting you that you want a deeper relationship with him. So we have this number, uh, 97,000. And I just want you to text this. It says, yes to Jesus, to 97,000. And somebody will contact you and say, hey, we just, we want to pray with you. We want to give you some materials. We want to help you because we don't want you to do life alone. You know what Ethan said about surrounding yourself with the right people is exactly what you need to do. And so we want to help you do that. So if y'all will text this, yes to Jesus to 97,000, uh, we'll contact you this week. Be in touch and so, and then you can let us know if there's other things that you want to pray about. You know, we're a praying church. And that's the one thing that I love about this. You know, I'll not, I'll not beg anybody to do anything except to pray. Come and pray with us. Come and believe with us. Because by praying is how we've gotten where we are today. And so I'm so thankful for all of you guys. I'm so thankful that y'all are here this morning. Guys, we love y'all. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you for being here. We'll see y'all next week.